Hey guys, today I've just been reading this book this morning, uh, Time, Innovation and Mobilities, and uh, it's really blown my mind about how traffic is really a political idea and not an engineering idea. So here's what we'll do. We'll go for a bike ride and I will talk to you all about this book. All right, guys, so let's go for a ride. Here's a fun fact, uh, using a cell phone, definitely against the law, but uh, reading a book, I don't think so. So let's try and do this on the move. Um, so I think this book is really interesting. It talks about how uh, the, the entire concept of, of traffic planning is based on very car-centric methods and that its view as a, uh, a scientific and engineering technical endeavor instead of being viewed as a political endeavor. And, and the, the fact that there's a lot of numbers and graphs really covers up the, the, the idea that um, it's, it has a political basis, but we've, we've kind of framed it in a way so that traffic engineering appears to be value free. Now, uh, Frank Peters, Peter Frank Peters, um, then takes this idea and argues that there are two, uh, let's say, contradicting or, um, or deferring points of view when it comes to traffic and public space philosophy and how we design the streets. So he argues that, oh, and I'm only able to do this because it's a three wheel cargo bike. You can sit up right, so. Um, he argues that there's, on the one hand, modernism, right, uh, coming from the tradition of uh, Le Corbusier, of uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, and, uh, and this idea of, of traffic segregation. Central to their designs, I quote from page 132, central to their designs was the ideal idea of zoning in which different urban functions, such as working, living, recreating, and being in transit were segregated. Le Corbusier's design of an urban neighborhood consists of three systems of circulation constructed on three levels, exemplifying the concept of zoning. Now, uh, in the section on designing the traffic landscape, he says, the creation of material conditions for the intersection of traffic at different speeds is achieved by adjusting several elements that determine any given specific traffic scenario such as infrastructure, urban layout, and geography. Traffic designers, interesting the word designers and not engineer are used here, uh, traffic designers work on a continuum of styles, the ends of which, he says, are formed by two ideal types. Ready for them? They're modern, so Le Corbusier and, and others, and the other one being organic. And uh, organic is, is what he argues is uh, has become the Dutch approach since the 1970s, at least in, uh, in, in living neighborhoods, right? So he says, what is the organic style? The organic style is both older and also newer than the modern. Whereas the modern style <laughs> attempted to solve the problem of intersecting speeds by preventing them from meeting in the first place, the organic design style seeks to integrate traffic participants. In this approach, the traffic landscape has been designed in such a way that, dif uh, that differences in speed were minimized. In practice, this means that fast road users had to adapt to slow road users. This approach is old in the sense that it entails a return to slow users. Sorry, uh, it returns to the tr kind of traffic landscape that existed before the introduction of motorized traffic. So this, is, this would be, uh, if you're following the Cycling Research Review series, this would be referring back to uh, the ideas of, of Monderman, the ideas of uh, Hamilton Bailey on shared space, um, and reflects a philosophy on, uh, at its, its furthest extent, why do we even design for cars in the first place, right? So then he goes on to uh, describe one of these uh, shared spaces. Um, 
a, a reconstruction of a central square in uh, a city in the Netherlands from what was before a, a normal road street with segregations and it is now paved with red cobblestones and nothing more nothing less no signs no sidewalks no bicycle lanes nothing not even the decorative railway sleepers only when you look more closely do you see the design elements that steer the gaze an old man trudges diagonally across the square. A mother parks her car, gets out and changes her kids' trousers. A truck gives priority to a group of cyclists coming from the right. All right. In a cargo bike. Great. This is, this is what this show should be. So, so then uh, Peters talks about this idea of risk, the relationality, the section, the relationality of time, space, and risk. He writes, the motorist driving at high speed in the city has little time to react to unexpected events, such as the pedestrian who is suddenly crossing the street. This means that certain skills and experience are needed to drive a car in urban traffic landscapes. Car drivers are asked to prove that they possess such knowledge by carrying a driver's license. The braking path is related to the speed of the, that the vehicle is going. The faster the car, the more meters away necessary to stop. A car driving at 30 kilometers an hour, well, uh, the energy is the square velocity, right? Remember this? The car driving at 30 kilometers an hour has a braking distance of 10 meters. A car going at 50 kilometers an hour needs 30 meters. Braking distance can be calculated by taking the sum of the time an individual needs to react, and the vehicle of a specific mass moving at a certain speed needs to come to a stop. This means that a, a car not only needs the, right, the road right in front of it, but that an even larger distance must be free in order to prevent collisions. So it's not just the, the six square meters that a car takes up, but it's also the, the, the many, many, perhaps hundreds of square meters that's uh, required in terms of road space to prevent uh, a collision. And in traffic engineering speak, uh, it's rather innocuous. Uh, we call it clear zone or uh, lane width and such, but it's not so neutral because in an urban setting, space is contested. Um, Peters goes on to talk about risk uh, and this idea that, that we are, by managing speeds, we are redistributing uh, who bears the burden of the risk. Thus, speed is not only a quality of a vehicle, but always presupposes a combination of skills, technical characteristics of a car, and an ordering of the traffic landscape in terms of the design and application of rules. When different traffic uh, participants encounter each other, uh, an exchange of time, space, and risk takes place. He, he argues that a pedestrian who walks calmly to the other side needs a certain amount of time, right? Uh, if a car is approaching, a pedestrian usually knows from the experience of the speed of the car uh, and the braking distance that goes with it will leave, if this impending object will leave him or her enough time to reach the other side. In this example, the space of a street is thus contested by two traffic participants. The street constitutes part of the passage of the pedestrian and that of the car driver. In the movements of both the pedestrian and the car driver, a continuous exchange of time space is taking place. The pedestrian must give space to the car driver by either standing still or walking faster, and the car driver must give way to the pedestrian by braking. The higher the speed of the car, the more space is needed to look ahead, to have enough time to react to unexpected situations. Conversely, the pedestrian has a very short braking distance, but needs time to cross the street. So in a way, the pedestrian is much more agile. The street is thus relational. It is part of the movement of both the pedestrian and the car driver. A street curve also illustrates the rationality of traffic space. When a street has wide curves, a car driver can take a quick turn left or right, but the pedestrian needs more time to cross the street. So this is a distribution of space. A street is also a distribution of time. Thirdly, a th uh, another type of distribution is, is risk. Aha, here we get to it. 
a traffic participant who who takes risks, for example, driving faster than loud, also enlarges the risk of an accident for other road users. Between motorized and non-motorized forms of transit, there are predictable asymmetries in the chances of being in a fatal road accident. So then uh, Peters goes on to talk about the re relationship between space-time and risk. He argues that, that this is constructed, right, uh, through design, through social interaction. Uh, that he quotes Harvey in saying that space is the order of coexistence, that that is the order among mutually contemporaneous states of things, while time is an order of succession, that is, order being the various different mutually coexisting state of things, which, because they are mutually coexisting, must, of course, have a spatial structure. According to this line of reasoning, uh, goes on to say, Peters, the passage of cars and bicycles are part of each other. The heterogeneous order of passage is partly laid down in the design of traffic landscapes, for example, by segregating bicycle and cars, uh, and this makes greater differences in speed possible. So he continues to argue that because passages are related to each other, um, that space-time and risk are all being exchanged continually in the act of driving, cycling, and walking. And, uh, and this naturally brings in the, the question of power. So if you're in a bigger vehicle and you take more time to stop and other people know that, then you could deliberately influence uh, how much you're putting other people at risk. Uh, and uh, he argues earlier that because pedestrians and cyclists are relatively more nimble, uh, that they uh, are the ones who are most have the most incentive to get away because they're not in a cage and they are most able to do so because their slowness gives them the flexibility to change direction. So this is one way in which the automobile driver exerts power on the road. The question here is should cyclists have their own bicycle lanes or is integrating them with other traffic a better solution? Now he goes on to talk about uh, Dutch design for the bicycle. Right. He, goes on to say that um, even in the case where the Netherlands a lot of people ride bikes and bicycle infrastructure we can say is relatively good um, that there uh, are certain underlying assumptions right of uh, even in the question of segregation or integration see uh, the Dutch approach is that in sections in which there are high car speeds um, and congestion high volumes uh, physical separation should usually be advocated, right? And this is in the interest of protecting cyclists. Uh, but uh, he, he points out uh, that perhaps this logic of segregation is actually aiming to increase the free flow of motor traffic, right? So, so on the one hand, you're protecting cyclists, but on the other hand, by doing so, you are uh, encouraging, in a way, faster uh, motorized traffic. So then he talks about the design manual, right? Uh, and the design manual has a very, very interesting uh, graph. It's actually innocuous if you're a traffic engineer. Um, but what this graph shows is that uh, speed on the x-axis and then volume of vehicles on the y-axis and based on this graph you can choose uh, you're given a guideline on whether choosing whether to segregate or to combine traffic now what's what's wrong with this graph what's wrong is that uh, this graph does not acknowledge the implicit political character of the problem right because we are taking for given that uh, there are automobiles going a certain speed. Uh, Peter says, the authors of the design manual have difficulty imagining a world in which the maximum speed of cars could be instead derived from bicycles. Right? What if we design a city in which the maximum speed was 30? Now, this is not a new idea, um, and and a lot of practitioners have latched onto it, but I think being expressed in this way is a new idea, right? I'll say it again. The authors of the manual have difficulty imagining a world in which the maximum speed of cars could be derived from a bicycle. This, their approach to the problem shows 
their sense of realism, right? That it's so ingrained in the way that we do traffic planning. But by taking the speed of motorized vehicles as a point of departure for the design of bicycle-friendly infrastructure, they make it impossible to consider the justification as this, as of this speed or the cycling speed as a political question and thus a choice. So uh, the volume and speed of motorized traffic is given and we design bicycle infrastructure based on that. But what the alternative is, is not, uh, is not whether to separate or, or to integrate bicycle traffic. The, the real alternative is how to design a city around the bicycle and not around the car as a given, because traffic is not given. Uh, traffic, the motorized traffic can be controlled. Motorized traffic can be tamed. Motorized traffic can be calmed. Motorized traffic can be banished altogether. In the technocratic vocabulary of the design manual, scarcity and speed are givens. And thus the task of the designer is to look for an equilibrium between form, function, and use by repeatedly adjusting these three linchpins in order to level the design. In practice, this approach yields a great number of possible choices. If we want to explicate the political character of passages, it would be better to make sense uh, of this by using politics of these passages as part of the design philosophy. Right. And this here comes, and the final argument that he makes is that um, passages are relational state space-time orderings, right? So how people and vehicles are ordered in space. Uh, and, and this exchange of time, space, risk are actually distributed among uh, cyclists, car drivers, uh, pedestrians. And for the designers of bicycle-friendly infrastructure, these are univocal categories. So, and then I, I finally also want to invite you to consider that you know, different people have different conceptions or abilities um, to negotiate these uh, ideas and spaces of uh, time and risk uh, and even their surroundings, right? So a, a person that is elderly, 80 years old, the probably slower reaction time than someone who is younger. Uh, kids don't understand the da dangers of traffic pose, so um, you're, you're restricting both their freedom of movement and also uh, adding stress and pressure uh, to the parents who are trying to develop you know, this freedom of mobility in a system in which uh, we've made it dangerous to move about for kids. Um, and, and I think that this is, this, is, this is the key point here, is that within this prescribed technocratic framework, there are underlying political assumptions. And these underlying political assumptions should not be then uh, driving our decisions. If they are driving our decisions, uh, we should at least make them explicit and not purely in the technocratic engineering domain. So uh, I guess the, the, the writing didn't work while reading a book, but, uh, but this is cargo bike is my way of appropriating public space for uh, private use. Anyways, um, hope you enjoyed this rant. Uh, we will be back with more fun stuff here at the Urban Cycling Institute, and I hope you have a nice day. Hey guys, uh, thanks for joining me for this rant of mine. Uh, so uh, Marco de Promesut has written earlier uh, a book review on this book as well, and it is posted on the Urban Cycling Institute website. So I'll link to that written book review below, and uh, hope to join you guys in very shortly back for another one of our Spokes podcast episodes. So take care and have a nice day.